Hey everybody, Richard Blissbrook here with another Authentic Networker podcast. Today we are live with one of the most special men in my life. Now you're going to learn to love him in the next 45 minutes. And I predict that you will then follow him for the rest of your life for his wisdom, his perspective, his thoughtfulness. And his great experience. So I met this gentleman about 10 or 15 years ago when he keynoted the National Convention of the Direct Selling Association. And I've heard a lot of keynote speakers. I've heard, you know, four star generals and former presidents of the United States and the top motivational speakers in the world. I've sat in the audience for all of them and appreciated all of their energy and all of their perspectives. But when I heard this man speak, I was gobsmacked. I was in awe. I had never heard anybody motivate a crowd of executives, company owners, not exactly the stand on your chairs kind of people, but I'd never seen anybody motivate a group of people from the inside out, it was like he was boiling the cells in their bodies with his thoughtfulness. And I trust that that is something you're going to feel in our talk today is this man's thoughtfulness. And I challenge you to go within inspired by him and look to motivate yourself from your thoughtfulness. He is an award-winning National Geographic photographer. For 25 years, he roamed the world, taking some of the most stunning photos, some of which graced the cover of National Geographic. Before he was 30, he was nominated for two Academy Awards for movies he produced. He's an occasional, highly sought after motivational speaker. He is a coach. He is a retreat leader. He's my island buddy. I, if there wasn't a mountain in the way, I could see him from my kitchen window on a neighboring island. I give you DeWitt Jones from the island of Molokai in Hawaii. Richard, how are you? I'm awesome, buddy. Good. Good. Oh, good. good to be here. Well, We've been building this up for a while. We've been planning it for a while. And I've got people do it all over the world that are tapped in, some of them on the Zoom, some of them on the Facebook, some of them on Instagram. And I have hyped you up pretty high. So yeah. you, and I, you and I get to deliver. <laughs> yes, boiling cells from the inside. No easy task. I just made it up in the moment. I you know, you I did. <laughs> on the fly. So, DeWitt, I, I want you to, you're just the most awesome storyteller in the world. So, what I am inspired to do is ask you some questions and have you tell some stories. And one of the things that always fascinates me about people when I learn what they do for a living is I just always sort of drop into this question, wow. How did you end up doing that? You know, because I don't know what they called it in high school, career counseling or something like that. I don't remember what it was. I probably didn't show up for it. But I don't remember anybody ever tapping me on the shoulder and saying, hey, Rich, how'd you like to take world-renowned uh, photos in some of the most uh, miraculous spots in the world and all those magazines that your mom's been buying since you were two years old and before, we'll put some of them on the cover of National Geographic. Nobody ever tapped me for that. I want to know how you got tapped for that. Okay. Well, like you, uh, I, you know, we took the Geographic long before I was born. And I'd grab it when it came into the house at night. I'd take it upstairs and read it. My dad would say, turn off the light. I'd turn on a flashlight. I'd I do whatever it took to stay up and stare at the pictures in that little yellow book because I, they were inspirational to me. And I, at a very deep level, 
And I guess they were to a lot of other people, Richard, because they're the only magazine that people keep. You know, uh, if all the geographics in the country disappeared at one time, half the houses would fall in on themselves because they're supported by big yellow columns in the basement. Why? Because my feeling of this why was that they celebrate what's right with the world. They make you feel proud to be a member of the human race. And even if they're taking on some difficult subject, they make you feel like you can, we're going to be able to handle it. So I, I was blown away by places I hadn't seen, by animals I hadn't seen, by cultures I hadn't seen. The world was just full of possibilities when I read that magazine. Did I really think about being a photographer? No, I was just inspired at that point. Now, when I was a, when I was a senior in college, uh, I'd been a drama major. I had no idea how I was gonna make my living as a dramatist. I didn't wanna go to New York and starve. So I, I applied and I was accepted into Harvard Business School, right? That's what you do. My father was ecstatic. Right? I was going to be off the dole. I was going to make lots of money. I was going to have security. And then one night, three of us got together and we just began to imagine, vision, what we would do after graduation. We could do anything we wanted. Wow. And at that time, a lot of people were excited about what they called people to people, you know, where a group of students from the U.S. would go somewhere that hadn't seen many Americans. And we were just... And we thought, let's do that. And we came up with this idea of kayaking 1,100 miles up the coast of Japan. Uh, there must have been a lot of beer. I don't remember exactly, but that was what we came up with. And I said, I'll make a movie out of it. I'd never made a movie before in my life. But I got up the next morning with my first real vision and the, and the passion, the passion, the energy that that vision brought with it and I, I withdrew my acceptance to Harvard and I applied out to UCLA Film School to learn how to make movies because I didn't know. Called my dad. One of the most deafening silences I'd ever heard in my life when he decided, when I told him that I wasn't going to Harvard, I was going to go to UCLA in film school. But we put it together and we talked the geographic out of a bunch of money and we went to Japan and we paddled up the coast and I made the movie and it was shown on TV in this country. It was syndicated in Europe. It was on the BBC and that was the start of it. Wow. That's bold. Well, you, you're bold when you're 23 and, and you know, what can they do? Right. Uh, I, 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 I didn't know. I didn't have enough on the line to even think about failure. And, and as I got better at what I did, I realized that boldness was very much a part of being successful. So I didn't worry as much. And, and the more I was successful, the more that allowed me to take more risks, which I've done all my life. Okay, I wanna grab you and pull you back kind of out of sequence because you speak about all that DeWitt as though it's fairly commonplace. I mean, you even spoke about, and I applied to Harvard Business School and of course was going to go to Harvard. Quite commonplace, of course. Um, yet you grew up, and you and I talked about this a little bit, you grew up in a pretty special environment. Would you speak to your father and your mother and the values and the belief that they instilled in you as a child? My dad uh, was a taskmaster. Uh, not, not awful, but, you know, he pushed me. He was the one who taught me about discipline and getting things done. My mother was the one who taught me about love and caring and empathy. And she also taught me about the wilderness. Um, my father was not a big outdoor guy. My mother loved it. And those were values that had been instilled in me. They worked very hard to give me a lot. And, and you know, as I look back, you know, you have... You have nurture, you have what your parents give you, you have your own intellect, you have your own discipline. 
and then there's, you know, there's a part of it of just being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I'd like to say that I figured it all out and I knew it all, but I, you know, why did I know it was the right thing for me to do to withdraw my application, to my acceptance to Harvard and go out to UCLA film school? I don't know. Everything inside me told me I should do it. And at that listen. point I thought, what have I got to lose? Let's, let's go for it. And you listen. And I listened. And I can give you three or four other times in my life when I've had that little voice inside be that strong. Tell me. You're, well, first of all, you're never going to hear your intuition unless you believe it's there and you listen to it. And it starts out pretty quiet. But as a photographer, there were hundreds of times when I'd go with my intuition as to how to approach somebody or where to be at sunset. And I didn't, couldn't do the double blind study and found out, well, if I'd gone the other way, what would have happened? But I, I count on my intuition to help me in my decisions. And then I count on my intellect. So the two of them together make a pretty good team. I did that when I got into keynote speaking. Uh, I had no idea that keynote speaking to large groups was even a, was even a, a business model that anybody could follow. Uh, and that was an even bigger leap of faith. How, what? I'm a photographer. To get on a stage and talk to several thousand people and motivate them and tell them what they ought to be doing with their life. Um, which actually, if I can divert for just a second, led to a very interesting break point in my life. I, I went to the National Speakers Association and I heard all these people talking about making a difference. And they would say, if I just make a difference in one person out there, you know, uh, and I'm going, I'm, I'm standing on a stage talking into darkness. I don't even know who these people are. I can't even see them. What kind of hubris do I have to tell them what they should do with their life? And I finally, trying to figure out how to make that work for me, I finally figured out that Making a difference is something somebody else tells you. Yes, do it. You made a difference in my life. I don't get to tell them that. What I get to make is a contribution. And when I get on the stage, the first thing I say is, I'm going to tell you the best that I've learned in my life. That's all I got. That's all any of us have. To share that openly and comfortably every day, the best we've got, to give it away and and see what happens to make our contribution. And that was the single most important thing in my, in my lecturing career was to say, I'm out there to make a contribution. I'm out there to share the best I got. And I could do that. That was easy. Yes, because you have a life rich with stories, stories to which you paid very close attention I don't know that I've heard a more articulate, thoughtful, precise, aware storyteller as you do it. And as I sat in the audience at the Direct Selling Association a long time ago and heard you start off, I, I, I had the question, I was sitting with the question, why did they hire a National Geographic photographer to speak? What is this guy going to do? And... You just went from story to story to story to story, and then you accentuated the punchline of every story was a was a photo, which was such a beautiful piece of art to bring your old craft into your new craft. And as I'm thinking about your intellect and your intuition, I'm thinking about, okay, maybe father intellect, mom intuition, Parents did a beautiful job of, of raising you and preparing you and empowering you to go do, to have the courage and the vision to do whatever you wanted to do in your life. And I know a little bit about your children, what they've done, and you've passed that on. I mean, you have like brilliant, capable, highly successful children. Yeah. My, my daughter heads up all the hiring for Patagonia, the outdoor retailer, and my son, at 25, I think, 
called me up and said, I'm going to Hollywood to make movies. And I said, Brian, you have a better chance of being drafted by the Lakers as a short white boy than you do of making it in movies. And he is now, in the last 15 years, he's made 70 features, produced 70 features. Right now, he's in Budapest making a $40, 000, $40 million film. Blows me away. Blows yeah. me away. But, uh, you know, those kids were always taught that they got a shot at, at anything they want to do. And I say they can do it? No, but they got a shot at it. And, and there were things when I went back, when I started speaking and went back and looked at my how I took pictures, I realized there were metaphors that were really important. Uh, probably the biggest one was that there's more than one right answer. That, that seems so obvious, but it turns out it's the key to creativity. And most of us, when we graduate from college, we've had thousands and thousands of multiple choice tests that, well, they tell the teacher that we know the material, but they tell us that there's one right answer. And if we don't get it right, we get marked down. And then they say, well, go be creative. And you go, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm looking for one right answer. I go out and shoot a thousand pictures now in digital in the afternoon to get one. I don't even think about, they're all right answers. And, and it makes it very easy for me to kind of turn a, that Rubik's cube of any problem that I face, any challenge that I face and look for the next right answer. So I share that with people uh, from the platform and I show them a picture that'll blow them away and then I say, but what if you just moved over a little bit? And I show them another one, they go, oh, oh my God, I never would have seen that. Partly because they're not photographers, but more because they don't think there's more than one right answer. And people just begin to flower when they do think, when they do realize that in the world. So one of the stuff, I mean, if we had your photos, we could tell the story of the dandelion, or you could. Um, you kind of danced around it there, but it, it doesn't do it justice without the photo sequence of this right answer, then this right answer. I mean, you, you telling that story, and you tell it many different ways with many different photos. I mean, that's your that's your powerful message, and it's so profound, it's so insightful that if we'll just keep looking and keep asking and keep our optimism uh that's where the breakthroughs lie and you you demonstrate that so beautifully with you know here's a photo of a dandelion and okay it's great and but then 10 variations later i mean where you end up is is just awestruck the audience is seeing where you ended up by continuing to ask what's next? What's the next right answer? And part of that, here's the other part, is going back to what I said about the geographic. I felt that the vision of the geographic was to celebrate what's right with the world, right? So, you know, they wanted me to go out and tell the most positive story that I could, not to deny real pain and suffering, but to, to put it in as large a context as I could, where you could, where you could see the beauty and the joy of it. And, and people knew that I worked for the geographic for seven years before anybody asked me to prove it. It was amazing. I'd walk into museums and say, hi, I'm from the national geographic. Would you open up those cases and take out those priceless artifacts so that I can photograph them? And they'd say, yes. And I'd go, you don't want to see an ID card or something? No, you work for the Geographic. Couldn't believe it. That's how much people trusted the magazine and felt that they that the magazine celebrated what's right with the world. I began to look at the world that way. To start out, to, to when I photographed, the idea was to say, what's here to celebrate? What am I falling in love with? What's the real point of this picture? And then to focus that, to enhance that, and let the rest fall away. That's very different than most of us do. We start out by griping about what's wrong with it, right? And, tr and concentrate on what's wrong, rather than enhancing what's right 
And when you enhance, the difference is that one of them takes energy from you and one of them gives you energy. When you concentrate on what's right in your life, that gives you energy. When you concentrate on what's wrong, that takes it away. I would rather concentrate on what's right. Ultimately, that's working out of the energy of love, right? And when you concentrate on what's wrong or what's fearful to you, that's working out of the energy of adrenaline. Fear runs out. Anybody knows that with adrenaline. One shot, lots of energy, then you're dead. Then you're gone. Then you're exhausted. Energy of love, endless when you tap into it. Now, that's getting pretty far out there, but I do know that when you concentrate, when you celebrate what's right, when you concentrate on those things and you enhance them, a lot better way to come at the world. So much energy giving, and in these times, so incredibly important. Yeah, we tend to probably make enemies when we're expressing what's wrong with the world, but it's hard to make enemies when we're coming from love and what's right with the world. I think I've probably said the most stupid things I've ever said in my life when I'm coming from what's wrong in the world. That's right. I mean, I get it. And, and there is, you know, I have a big yin and yang symbol up on my wall. And there's a dark portion of that symbol and there's a light portion of that symbol. And they're about equal. And maybe they are in the world, you know, but that, that yin and yang symbol doesn't change either. There's going to be light and there's going to be dark, always. It's not all either going to mush to gray or it's not all suddenly become light. It's not all suddenly become dark. At least that's what the ancients who made up that symbol were saying. Well, my question is, where am I going to put myself? I'm going to put myself on the light side. And if you look at that symbol, even in the dark, there's always that little light. So that's, that's what I'm going to go after, not by denying the dark side, but by saying, I'm, I, I gain so much more. I'm so much happier when I do the things every day in my life to be in the light. And you do. You're, every time I talk to you, you're coming from that perspective. Everything I see you write, everything I see you record is true to that philosophy and those values. And I think that's why you're so trustworthy as a spiritual leader, a coach, a speaker, like National Geographic, they never varied from their mission, from their core. They built extraordinary trust. I have a, another story I want you to tell us about that struck me, and maybe it'll strike other people. The day you walked into the um, headquarters of National Geographic to accept your position. Would you share that story with people and sure. what the president yeah. said to you? Yeah, I, I'd done the, the Japanese kayak trip. I'd been a movie photographer. We'd taken the movie back to the Geographic. And uh, some of the people from, obviously, from the magazine saw it, liked it, knew me. And a couple years later, in a story that's too long to go into, but they gave me my first still assignment. So it was going to be a story on the conservationist John Muir. And my first published pictures anywhere were going to be in the National Geographic magazine. And they called me up and they said, fly back to Washington. We want to orient you to how we do things and how you're going to work as a, as a still photographer petrified, petrified. I was not a still photographer. I'd learned something about making movies, but I'd probably made, I had taken 20 rolls of still film in my life, and now I was going to go shoot for the National Geographic. And I'm flying back, and on the plane, all I'm thinking about is, how am I going to prove myself? I mean, they're going to expose me as a total charlatan. They're going to throw me out. It's not going to work. And I get to, I don't know how many of you have been to the Geographic, but it's a very imposing building. And in the downstairs, they have a thing called Explorer's Hall. And they have submersibles and flags from Everest and, you know, ice axes from the top of the world and the most beautiful pictures you've ever seen in your life. And I'm going, I am so over my head. 
this is not going to work. And they bring me up to the third floor, which is where the photography section was. And I have an appointment with Bob Gilka, who was the head of photography. Gilka was reminiscent of Patton. He, he, he did not suffer fools lightly. In fact, there was a mat outside his, his office that said, wipe your knees before entering. <laughs> and I crossed that mat and I go in and I sit down and I really, I can feel the sweat dripping off my insides. And he's writing on the desk and he looks up and he goes, Jones, Jones, if you work for the Geographic and you do, because I just hired you, you're very good. You don't have to prove yourself. What? What? I, I couldn't believe it. I thought, I, he, what? I don't have to prove myself? And then he looked up again and he leaned over the desk and he said, but by God, you better improve yourself every day. And it just was the most important piece of, of wisdom. I needed it exactly at that moment. Don't prove, improve. He knew I was scared. He knew I was terrified, and he knew if I thought about competing with all the other photographers that I'd probably burn out. He said, don't even think about it. They don't have your eyes. You have your eyes. You don't have their eyes. You can never be them. So just go out and get better. And because of the group he was building there, he said, hey, if you find something we can all use, share it. We'll all get better. And then he took me down the hall to the office of Bruce Dale, who's one of the five finest photojournalists ever in America, and said, hey, this is the new kid. Teach him what he needs to know. But that mantra, which I would repeat to myself over and over when I went out to photograph, don't prove, improve. Don't worry about, there are no other photographers in the world do it. There is only you, and every day you will get better. Amazing what that allowed me to do. So... I'm going to tackle a risky subject, but I think we're up for it. And I'm not asking you this to it to delve into um, either side or politics or or any of that, which would be easy for us to do. But I, I want you to share with the world who is watching America, has been watching America for the last six months be very easy for people to be sort of sucked into the what's wrong with the world and sucked into the I'm right and you're wrong. I don't know that our nation's ever been more polarized than it is today. Maybe since the Civil War, I've heard people say. And man, it sure feels that way. It sure feels like there's only about half of the audience that we can connect with because if we don't share politics, we don't share humanity. So how do you apply the next right answer and what's right with the world? What do you say to us in America and the rest of the world watching America for inspiration? Because we are supposed to be inspiring the world. What do you say to us? Well, I'd say a couple things. Uh, first of all, the media, both left and right and center, makes money on controversy. They make money on stoking emotion. Good emotion, bad emotion, doesn't matter. Uh, and, and so they tell us stories, just like I tell stories. And those stories may or may not be true. But if we listen to them long enough, any of them, we'll begin to believe them. Now, it's interesting to me that uh, I have another house uh, that we live in in the summers in South Lake Tahoe. And uh, Lake Tahoe is fairly liberal, not ridiculously liberal, but sort of liberal. And down the mountain, just a little ways, is Carson City, which is pretty conservative. Uh, I go from one to the other and I work with all kinds of people. I'm in shops, I'm getting gas, I'm buying tires, I, whatever it is in my life. 
and I have no feeling like, ooh, there's a conservative, or wow, there's a liberal. No, they're just people. They're just people. We're all going to, you know, and we see something, we go, look at that, is that beautiful? And like, yeah, that's really good. Or, hey, you know, you can get cheaper tires down the road, or whatever, right? We treat ourselves like human beings on a daily basis. That's really what it is. Now, if, if I was to, to, to get out of my car with a huge Trump symbol or a huge Biden symbol, then maybe we get into a fight. But absent that, and in reality, we just go about our business and, and we work with each other and we have no idea what the other person's politics are. So I, I keep trying to remember that when, when I'm told that we've never been more polarized. And I go, well, okay, if I just keep watching this news channel or that news channel, I believe it. But in my life, that's not the way it, it seems to work. And, you know, I, I could drive a long way before out of the corner of the, out of the window of the car, I would see a political rally for either side. Now, I can watch 10 of them at night on the news, but in my life, that's not how it works. And the other thing, Richard, is when I go and I speak to audiences about celebrating what's right with the world, and those audiences range the entire gambit, and I have no idea when I'm talking what anybody's political persuasion is. And people come up and they say, God, you were talking right to me. I, I want to celebrate what's right. I, I want to believe there's more than one right answer. And I go, and I have no idea whether you're a Biden supporter or a Trump supporter, and I don't care because I know you're a good human being. And I know when I went out and, and worked for the Geographic and I was in places where I knew that the people I was working with were of a different political persuasion than I was, fabulous people, fabulous people, give you the shirt off their back. Yeah. So I've had yeah. that many experiences that I just, I don't believe the story. I believe we're all believing this story right now and probably will for another few months, but eventually maybe we won't. We have a lot more in common than we have differences. And oh, perhaps absolutely. If, if we ask that question, what do we have in common? And let's focus on that. Then we stay connected and we stay respectful and we stay honorable. And then we can move forward as a nation Bringing it back up to a lighter subject, I'm always fascinated. I maybe I've heard you mention this once, but I think the audience would be fascinated to hear. Where have you been in the world with your camera on assignment? Where, what seven wonders of the world have you photographed on your belly, laying there all night, waiting for the sunrise? freezing to death or burning up or thirsty or having spiders crawl across you. I don't know whatever you've done, but where have you been and what have you photographed that was awe-inspiring? You know, that's, a, that's another story thing because uh, people have a vision of the National Geographic photographer. And most people have a vision that the further away you get, from where you are, the better it gets, the cooler it gets, the right. more beautiful it gets. That's not true. That's just not true. It, it really depends on how you're going to view wherever you are. And uh, so I've, I've traveled, you know, to the ends of the earth uh, in the Arctic Circle hiking for days. Uh, there were a lot of mosquitoes and it was really hard hiking and it wasn't particularly good photographs. And I'd come back and they'd go, oh my God, you went for two weeks in the gates of the Arctic. Wasn't it great? No, actually pretty miserable, but I got the shots they wanted me to get, right? And then I might walk out in my garden and be dumbstruck by an agave plant uh, that has been growing there for 10 years. So what I'm, what I'm saying is this is a miraculous planet and it doesn't get better 
when you just get further away from where you are. What you need to do is open your eyes to the beauty that's around you all the time. Uh, so some of the, you know, I got dropped off on floating icebergs to in front of a glacier so that I could use the helicopter to give me some size ratio of how big the glacier was. And, and you know, I was maybe 50 feet away from a eight foot grizzly standing up like this where the bell, where the, my gun was just swiggling down to nothing because I knew if I shot the damn thing, it'd eat me anyway. Uh, right. Were those my great photographic moments? No, I was scared. Yeah, I was terrified. Uh, but I did some things like that. I, I One of the films that I made... Um, was a film called Climb on a 2200 foot wall in Yosemite. Uh, nowhere near as good as Free Solo, but you know, it was made a long time ago and it was one of the first really good climbing movies that was made. I did all that. Those were things that I did. But honestly, by the end of my career at the Geographic, I didn't even care where they sent me because I knew I would find something amazing when I went out there. And it, and a lot of times when I went to, when I took an assignment where I really didn't know much about the place, those turned out to be the best ones. So you're saying that if I live in Boringville, in the boring, most boring state, in a little studio apartment with a whole lot of other studio apartments, if you came to my studio apartment, on assignment for a week with your camera, you and I playing with what the universe gave us to play with, light, rain, perspective, we could find a lot of right answers outside my apartment, inside my apartment, on the roof of the apartment, in the garden, in the park next door. You could find miracles anywhere. You can, you can. Now, am I am I saying that if you if I lived in a tiny apartment with a lot of other apartments and it was two hours of driving to get out of the city that I wouldn't try and move? I probably would because I really like to be in nature. But I've also seen people and met people who found amazing. I mean, when I would go on assignment, the first things that I would look for were the people who just loved where they were. Even if I didn't, you know, okay, you show me Omaha. Whoa, let me tell you about Omaha. And I'd find the guy who was just, bl and he would show me. And by the time I finished, I was excited about Omaha. I didn't know Omaha one way or the other. I had no judgment coming in. It was just a place. But there were people who loved it. And there were people who loved Alaska. And there were people who loved Japan. And there were, you know, I would find them. And there were people who loved you know, water lilies or whatever it was, you would find the people who that was their window. That was their window to fall in love with the world. And they could see it. And I said, well, let me see it. Show me how. Um, so I, I, I said, I really didn't much care where they sent me. I tended to be an outdoor guy. I was sort of their national park guy because that's where I flowered and where I love to be. But I, all my assignments were not that. You had to do, you had to be a jack of all trades with them. All right, DeWitt, send us to bed with a bedtime story. I know you got a hundred of them. Which one surfaces right now? Your best story for this moment that we will never forget the lesson embedded within. You know, I, I, uh, the one that's coming up for me is that I was, I was in Yellowstone uh, one time and I was supposed to photograph uh, the geysers there. And I went out to photograph uh, Old Faithful. And Old Faithful goes off about every hour, and there's a big digital clock there that says the next eruption will occur at 12.06, and then it counts down to or it just clicks over. And there were about 1,500 people all sweaty and together, and they're looking at this tiny little hole on the ground. 
it said the next eruption will occur at 1206. And at 1207, the guy in front of me turns up to his wife and said, it's late, Martha, and leaves, right? And I'm going, man, you're not getting it. You're not getting the miracle that is about to happen. And when the geyser finally went off, it was the middle of the day and, and the, there wasn't very good light and there were a lot of people and kids were crying and dropping their ice cream cones and stuff. And I thought, why are you trying to see it in this context? So that night, uh, I went out at sunset and there was nobody out there because everybody was off having dinner somewhere. And the geyser went off and it was lit by the setting sun and it was magnificent. And then I just stayed out there. I think that was against the rules, but I just laid down out there and the full moon came up and the geyser went off again about two in the morning. And it was unspeakably beautiful. And I realized, you know, I, I felt both very, very little and yet very safe and at the same time, very large. Uh, it was one of those moments of both awe and wonder that puts it back in perspective, that takes us out of our little human-centered world where you'd say, it's late, Martha, and leave, in standing in front of this magnificent, amazing universe and being just so friggin' grateful that you're allowed to be here as a sentient being. And to realize that the real seven wonders of the world are to see, to hear, to smell, to taste, to touch, to laugh, to love. Five of them were given. Two of them we get to choose every day, to laugh and to love. And if I continue to give myself those experiences where I really recognize what a privilege, what a joy, what a, an amazing miracle it is that I'm alive on this planet, then that's what I'll choose, to laugh and to love. I knew you'd bring it home. Now you all know why I choose DeWitt as my guide in life in this era of my life. If you want to hear more from DeWitt, about DeWitt, you want the wit to speak for your company, speak to your large team. If you just want to tap into his blog or his Facebook page, it's not hard to find. DeWittJones.com. Thank you, DeWitt. You bet, sir. Extraordinary gift. And I'm going to leave it right there.